that you shouldn't. And so I was out with a, uh, um, uh, a pastor yesterday, day before yesterday, and so I was out with him and his son, and he did something. And so uh, they wanted to meet, and so uh, um, they uh, treated me to one of my favorite places, Papa Do's. I have to go in there right. I have to go in there with a right mind renewed by the Holy Spirit and all of the angels of God up in there, man. So, uh, and I did good. I did good. I even ordered a dessert at the end and took one bite and then said, y'all can keep this. So that was a miracle. A sign and a wonder. Jesus is coming back next Tuesday based on what I did on that one. You know, but, uh, but you know, but I noticed something. You know, always be willing to learn. His, his son changed my life because the, the waitress came to the table and he immediately handed her a $20 bill. And, and so I looked, and so I was confused. I didn't know what was going on, you know. I didn't know if he knew her, but he immediately handed her a $20 bill. And so she took it and said, thank you. And then uh, she left. And uh, I just couldn't contain my silence. And I said, oh, you just wanted to be a blessing to her. He said, yeah, he said, but he said, it's something I started practicing years ago. He said, I blessed them on the front end and the back end. He said, for a couple of reasons. He said, number one, he said, you blessed them on the front end. He said, it changes their whole countenance and their character. If they had a bad attitude, it changed right. He said, I always do $20, always. He said, I always do $20 up front. He ended up a $20 bill. And I'm sitting there like, I think I'm about to come up today. <laughs> but then he said, but I started doing it because of something that happened. So his dad is the one who taught him to do that. And he said, I did it, he said, because I went to a restaurant years ago. He said, I was sitting there, and he said, I was close to the area where they cook the food and the servers hang out. And he said, I overheard them complaining about church folk, about how cheap they are, and they're never on time. And he said, he said everything that they were saying was based on their, um, their experiences with people, particularly on Sunday morning after church, because that's when he was there. He said he's listening to complain about, you know, um, how bad their attitudes can be. They're very cheap if they leave a tip at all. And he said, he said at that point, he didn't even want to let them know he was a pastor. And, and so that's unfortunately, that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a terrible stereotype. You know, there are some, there's always some truth to some stereotypes doesn't mean that's the whole group. It just means that a certain part of that group, they known for this type of foolishness, you know. And so uh, why am I sharing all of this? Oh, I know why I'm sharing it. Bingo. And so, uh, and so, um, so I was just listening to that, and I, just, I was just like, wow, I have learned something today that I think I'm going to start practicing. He said, it's always 20. He said, sometimes it's 10. He said, but it's usually 20. And uh, I'll make a side announcement, of course, this is, this is Lionheart Church, this is Lionheart Baptist Church Sunday. Y'all know what I mean by that? Where there is no children's church today. I'm going to change that on fifth Sundays and make sure we have some workers, particularly for the younger kids. But on fifth Saturdays and Sundays, I try to give the workers a break so that they can be in here. So we don't mind the kids. If the kid is just won't stop crying, of course, taking them out. You know, I think we have a little small um, uh, dog in here also. Um, some people have service dogs, and so so the little dog might get a little happy. He might say, "Man," and let out a little bark. Don't be alarmed, you know. And so uh, you know, but generally, people who have a service dog, they have papers that that will uh, you know validate the fact that yes, this is a service dog. He goes everywhere with me, so we'll never have a problem with that. So I'm just letting you know that you might hear a couple of little strange, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, service dogs are very quiet, but it's going to be a trip if he start barking. He might feel it today. We'll never know. Amen. You know. Amen. And so, uh, so um, but yeah, so back to the story. You know, so, you know, I said all of that to say, come out and support the dance company tonight. If you can. Yes, it's okay for you to go back home and spend more gas to come back out. You know, on, you know, I do weddings, and I do funerals, I do all of those things. And unfortunately, one of the worst things that I think is when people will come to your wedding and they get there when it's over. And definitely are going to eat your food. 
that's called being raggedy. You know, I've seen people who, family members, who were late for their own mother's funeral. I did one one time, because you know, a lot of times, things don't start on time. Not at this place, I mean, you know, you come here, that service starts exactly at 9.30. I don't believe in being late. I don't even believe in being on time. If you're on time, you're still late. Should always leave early, okay? And so uh, it has nothing to do with lifestyle. It has nothing to do with how many kids you have. We got six kids. Yeah, we never were late. In our younger years, before we were pastors, you know, and all those kids were really, really, really young. I mean, we just, boom. So I'm just encourage you. You know what? I think they open up the doors at what time? 5.15. So guess what time you should be here? Well, the thing starts at 6. So you can get here at 5.15. But, you know, don't come in here trudging halfway through the thing. See, you play that with, perf- with, with, with some of that stuff in the world. I mean, you know, you go to those plays, show up two minutes late. Uh, so sorry, the doors are closed. I got to wait till intermission? Mm-hmm. That's what happens when you show up late. You miss stuff. Okay, so, you know, have a little what you call respect and honor. Don't get here trudging up in here like you on a picnic and, and you're just going to make a guest appearance. Come in, these people have worked on this thing painfully for hours, for months to give you something that is free for you to enjoy. And all you got to do is show up early, Early. not on time. Everybody say, amen. 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 Just trying to see if the service dog was going to say anything. <laughs> believe that little dog. I ain't even seen the dog. They just told me, hey, just letting you know. Uh, I'm always playing around, okay? So y'all gonna do that for us. So y'all gonna listen online that didn't come to church this morning. We'll see you on this evening. Not tonight. Matter of fact, we'll see. We won't see you this evening. We'll see you this afternoon. Yeah, yeah. The evening kicks in at 6 p.m. Yeah. Okay, so y'all gonna do that for us. So we can come and support and, and be ministered to through dance. And uh, I believe it's called the story of David. So that'll be great. And then uh, Lorenzo, hand me those. Uh, no, hand me the boxes first. Also, uh, put up that text uh, graphic for me. Um, if you haven't done so far, text Lionheart Church. Thank you. Text Lionheart Church to. Let me be careful here, because that is a recipe for disaster. Text Lionheart Church to that particular number to be placed on our auto texting service. No, I will not be sending you a daily scripture reading. All you got to do is open up your Bible and read yourself. Okay, but we will keep you updated with emergencies, uh, weather related events, uh, reminders like today, different things like that. Okay, and so uh, you can text that. And then the second thing is we got to start reminding people please silence your cell phones, turn, look at your phone right now, and put it on vibrate. You know, because more and more we're starting to lose things because of those phones ringing. So put that on there. Okay, something that we're doing, um, just a couple of things. For you that are in other states, you'll be able to get on in this, get in on this another way. I'll share that with you in just a moment. And so we're going to do something. Uh, Franklin Graham does this. So we're going to start something called uh, Christmas Shoe Boxes um, for the uh, group in Zimbabwe that we have adopted. In case you don't know this, we have, we, their, their church was uh, torn down because of a storm, so we rebuilt the church for them, and uh, we bought them some land to build a two-story orphanage. Um, we take care of mother supplies. There's about 30 or 40 kids that we send to school, clothe them, feed them, get them medical supplies. We send them. They have a guaranteed check from this church no matter what every single month. So that way they don't have to be concerned. Is it coming? Is it going to be higher? Is it going to be lower? It's a guaranteed minimum that we give them every single month, okay? That's your money that's going to the right place. You understand? So the Lord traces that back to you, okay? And so we're going to up the ante, as they say. And uh, April brought this to my attention about doing shoe boxes. Let me say something. Eric will share something with me that was very, I don't know if it was heartbroken or touching. And she was talking about a particular child over there. I don't know if it was Zimbabwe, Kenya, or someplace. might have been Kenya. And uh, the boy had never owned anything in his life. So he broke down in tears when he finally had a toothbrush. Now, you need to keep a particular perspective when a child cries because for the first time in their life, they own something, and it's just a toothbrush. We got all of this prosperity 
We got all of the stuff we waste money on, and 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 you know. So these are shoe boxes, and so uh, they have to be sent out at a particular time. And so you can the the boxes will be over here at the end of service, and um, all you have to do is fill it to about this size, okay? Um, one will be for a boy, one will be for a girl. So you'll take the shoe box, and then it has a list of items that you should put in the shoe box. Don't be coming up with no God ideas, the holy, no, pay attention to what's on the list. We don't want to just buy them stuff. We want to buy them what they need. Because if you get people what they need or they ask for, that's how you bless them the most. Well, I just feel like they needed a painting. They didn't need a painting. They can't do nothing with a painting except look at it. That's nice, and then you ignore the painting for the next 20 years. They need real stuff. They need stuff to make them happy, feel special, for them to understand that God, when these kids get this type of stuff, they know God is real. Okay. Ain't no more sense in trying to minister to a poor man until you put some food in his stomach. Okay, and so there is a list. So if you get one for a boy, okay, and this is one for a girl, and it'll have it on the box, and then it has a list of the different things that you can put in the box. You want to fill the box, and here you see if y'all can get kind of close up. This is the one for girls, so it'll be a list. You want to fill the box up to about that size. Same thing for the boys. You want to do this as soon as possible, so we don't want to contact you in three months. You got that box? No. Uh, the boxes need to be in, I think, by the end of, matter of fact, two weeks. Put it that way. I'm not going to tell y'all because then you'll wait to the last minute. Because you have to get the box back, then we have to take the contents of each box, box and then convert it to a Ziploc bag. And put all the information for this, like this particular uh, Kutsi, that's her name, Mune. That's his name. So we have to convert all of this to a Ziploc bag so it can go into a bin to be shipped over to Zimbabwe. Y'all understand me? Okay. And so we encourage you to do that. There'll be boxes here. These are, these are items that maybe, maybe would cost you $20 at the most. But let me tell you something. That $20 for them would be the equivalent of maybe $20,000 for you. Because when you don't have any of this type of stuff, let me tell you something. This right here. A little thing that at that the store might cost three to five dollars, and it's a little small group of cars. I mean, these kids don't have anything to play with, so that's why they make stuff out of trees to play with. April came, I think it was April to share me when she was over there, and the kids don't have any toys, so they were playing soccer with a can and enjoying themselves, you know. And so we want to be a, you know, um, you know, we have done a lot with benevolence here. We'll still do it some, but I'm going to pull back because that was kind of getting out of hand. When people know that you give money, then they start coming up with ideas how to get it. So, so I'm going to be focusing more benevolence on our current members, but let me tell you something. you got to start learning how to manage your money correctly. That's right. That's right. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. Now, there's not any type of shot towards people or anything like that. People have real needs, and trust me, there was a time when I needed everybody's help. There was a time we were counting quarters to get gas. Okay, it was a lady across from me yesterday at the gas station. I was looking through the window. She pulled up, and then I could see her counting the bills over and over again to get gas. And so I just asked her, was she low? And she said, yeah, so I just filled up her tank, you know. And so uh, and it's good to be a blessing. It's a great feeling to put a smile on someone's face, you know. So, But more and more, we're going to be shifting um, a lot of our benevolence over to people who they don't have any money to mismanage. They can't get a job, okay? When, when Kim first approached us about Zimbabwe, it's because they had no food. That's a different element. It's a different element not having any food to eat versus you upset because you can't go to Papa right, right. Yeah, That's two different things. Right. You understand what I'm saying? So wrap that. Go ahead and grab me those shoes too. Lorenzo, get it. All right, thank you. So... So for you all, now some of you may want to get in on this too. This is a genius idea. This came from Kenya. And um, it took, April ordered these and it took two weeks to get here. Um, but it's better for us to order instead of shipping them here and then to Zimbabwe, they can ship them from Kenya straight to Zimbabwe. Okay. And so this is what you call the expandable shoe. 
And uh, I don't know, how, well, y'all can't see it. But um, so for you all that don't, can't, because the shoebox is only for people that are here local in Atlanta at the product church. For you all, you can get in on this. It's $20 a shoe. Um, it is a very high quality shoe and it's expandable. If you can see this little hook, which is a five for the number of grace, you know. So, because let me tell you something. I put down something that I wanted you to think about for a moment. Um, in Africa, there are about 44 cars for every 1,000 people. It's about the same or a little bit worse in India. And it's the same in some of the more Middle Eastern Arab nations. And so the majority of the planet folk is walking. Not driving, not catching a bus, walking. So let me give you an example of something I had to adjust my attitude, you know, because one of the things we're going to talk about today is judging people the wrong way. And so there's something that, you know, I personally couldn't stand, which is I don't like to see women drag their feet. Whoosh, 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 whoosh. And so I'm the guy at the restaurant that when the woman walks in and does that, I just, if you don't pick your feet up. And so that used to bother me. I'm just like, pick your feet up, quit sliding. You got legs. I mean, just all of that type of craziness. Until I went to Nigeria and found out, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that y'all don't have cars and some of y'all got to walk 16 miles just to go to work. How many know if you had to walk 16 miles one way, like those pastors, with a bullet in your back, you're not lifting your legs. You just slide them because you're tired before you start working. And they don't have nice shoes like this. They have raggedy hard flip flops. While we upset, never mind. Okay, so this is called an expandable shoe. So there's a hook here. And so if you're size eight, you can put it there. If you're size nine, you move it here. Size 10, you move it here. Size 11, move it here. It's a hook that allows the shoe or the sandal to expand out. Very important for people overseas in what we call third world countries because you can get them a pair of shoes and how many you know, then the child has outgrown it in six months. So this is what you call a genius idea to be a blessing to people who need a good, one of the biggest issues over there are shoes and socks. They just walk, walk. This is an, ex this is an extremely high quality shoe and it has that hook, the number five. And, and I, I tried it on myself and it just, it just allows you to expand like that. $20 a pair to change a child's life, to make them more comfortable. Okay, so we can put up this graphic. Oh, never mind, it's already up there. So instead of everybody sending $20 to the company in Kenya and they gotta send out individual orders, what we decided to do is, is that for all of you that wanna give to this effort, take a picture of that. We gotta use a better graphic next time because they may not be able to see that white writing on that. Hopefully you can, but take a picture of that. You, uh, you give, it's through Zale, uh, info at itsharvesttime.org. Um, do not give the offering to Lionheart Church. That's going to produce confusion. Okay, that's too tedious. If you're going to give to this effort, do not give it to Lionheart Church. Give it to harvesttime.org. That is Kim's ministry. She's from Zimbabwe. And, um, and so we run everything through that and so what we'll do is I think the amount is we are doing this right now we're at 70 kids but April said we should really add more to that because in between now and then more orphans will come to the place so I think we're doing it for like 100 or 120 kids so the amount whatever the group is the full amount is two thousand eight hundred dollars just something for us to work collectively. Again, let me make it clear. Take a picture of that. Don't give it to Lionheart Church. Give it to Harvest Info at itsharvesttime.org. So take a picture of that so that you remember. It's $20 a shoe. Okay, most people can do $20 for a pair of shoes for a child to be comfortable. Remember what the Bible says, what, you, what good thing you do for another, the same shall you receive from the Lord. Now remember, when the Lord does it for you, he doesn't give you a $20 shoe back. What that shoe meant to the individual, God has to do something for you that means the same thing to you at your level. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. So I encourage you to do that. I think this is very, very unique, very, very special. And we need to be able to take care 
of the family of God around the world. You see that in scripture, um, big time. And, um, and the Lord is very pleased by that. He said, he that gives to the poor lends to God. So whether you want to buy 20, whether you want to buy uh, one shoe, 20 shoes, whatever it is, whatever amount you decide to give, just give it to harvest time. And then we will send the company, because we've tested them out, they are straight legit. And um, we will, and what's nice is they use the Kenyan people to do this. So it also employs them. And so, but we'll send one check to that company. They can do a certain amount of shoes and then boom, they will deliver it to the front door of that place. Everybody say amen. amen. All right, so again, you know, go ahead and grab these from me, Lorenzo, thank you. So again, you know, uh, the Bible says, do what is in your heart to give. If you don't have it, there'll always be another opportunity. And the Lord will always work it away. Don't be concerned. You know, if we have extra, we'll set it aside and do more. You know, uh, my father was like that. He was, my father was so sensitive to children not having food that every single time we ate, he would not even fix his plate until all of the kids around the table had fixed theirs and started eating. He would just sit there. He would wait until all of us got our food. And once we start eating, then he would get his food. My dad hated for children to not have food. And that's just a bad feeling. It's a different type of pain. You know, I mean, you know the pain when you just got hungry because you waited too long. What is the type of pain and depression you deal with where you're hungry and you have no idea where to get food? It's just a bad, it's just a bad feeling. And you have to live off of food. And so I want to move over. I, I just have a heart's desire to do, you know, people have made an impression on me in that area. One was the Chinese gentleman when I was in South Korea who said that their church gave 90% of their money to missions and benevolence. And I never forgot that. I never forgot that. And then, you know, Franklin Graham, I want to be able to do that big in the future where, you know what, we have something someplace and I put 15 of y'all on the airplane. Bye. Where are we going? Uh, you're going to a remote part of the planet to feed some people who don't have any food. And then we're going to bless them and... And, and it's so people, it's so amazing because when my wife and I took all of those toys to Nigeria for those kids, they were so overwhelmed. They, they, they literally went into shock. They just stood there. Amen. Yeah, you got to remember, they didn't have one soccer ball. And now they're looking at a bed full of everything, baby dolls, purses, toys, frisbees, everything. Cost us hardly anything. I think I had to spend an extra dollars, hundred dollars for the extra piece of luggage or whatever. And, and they just stood, they wouldn't even touch it. They just sat there with their mouths open. Just like that. And, and the kids had enough sense to give a lot of it away. Their attitude was, we didn't have none, so one is good enough, we'll just give, you know. And, and you pass the blessings along like that, you know. So, you know, so how many are you gonna help us with that effort? You know, and so we, you know, whenever we have done something, we always do more than enough. And what I always do is always monitor it, and whatever is not there, then the church makes up the difference. But I really have to do that because y'all are, you know, so we're giving to worthy efforts. People that give to worthy efforts. When you come up with some old, never mind. So y'all got that. All right, let's go ahead and finish this. I want to go ahead and try to push through this so that um, they need to then be able to uh, tear up the rest of the sanctuary so that they can, uh, <laughs> I always joke, and so that they can prepare for this evening and then we can get you outside. We can have your nappy nappy and uh, eat a little something and boom. Y'all ready for the word? I think I covered everything. Hopefully I did that correctly when it comes to that. Oh, let me put my water back up here in case I kick it over and have to walk on water. <laughs> terrible joke, terrible. That was terrible. That was just as dry. Something your grandfather would come up with. I'm so tired of running to people at the grocery store with these jokes. And that's me all this. I was at the, let, I'm, I'm going into the word. I was at Yogli Mowgli, the yogurt place. And y'all, there was this lady. She had to be at least 90 years of age. And, and she was there with her daughter, and the daughter had to go to the counter because I told her, hey, say, hey, say look, you don't have to guess. They have free cups to let you taste it. She said, really? She said, yes. And so, and so, uh, so she left, she went to the counter, and then her mother looked at me, come here, son. I'm thinking I'm about to get a, a prof, man, a prophetic word, oh. I'm thinking I'm about to go higher, Jesus has come down. She leaned over, she said, I gotta tell you something. 
I said, what? And she told me one of the nastiest jokes I ever heard in my life. <laughs> yes, she did. For some reason, I tend to draw these people to me. I'm dead serious. Then I got this one guy at Walmart. He forgets that he told me the joke the last time. So when he sees me, he comes over, little farmer, you know, he said, hey, I said, what? He said, when a, uh, when a bee um, needs to go to the bathroom, where does he go? Where? BP. <laughs> In case you don't know what BP is, it's a gas station. But see, BP. Man, why do I keep being sent these people? Why? Where are they? They just see me. Oh, that's the girl I can tell, tell my nasty, nasty, dirty, corny joke to. I just seem to attract them or something. I don't know. I need to pray for myself or something. I don't know what I need to do. Let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and do this. You know, today we have a sermon called Flies in the Ointment. It's a very serious teaching. Brace yourself. And uh, we're just going to go through it very quickly. But I'm going to be very, very serious. About 25% way through, I'll share a scripture with you about why the Lord chastises us. This is very serious because the Lord spoke to me and gave me that. Okay, he gave it to me in the shower. And all he said, whenever the Lord speaks to me in that particular arena, I know it's something very serious and it has huge ramifications. And all he said was, there are flies in the ointment. And so, so we're going to read a couple of scriptures and I want you to help you understand how many you know, you know, everything with God is about us hearing from him successfully. You know, this particular month is coming to a close. We're talking about how to hear from God, how to get answers from him, as well as being patient. And so, you know, um, so there are things that you will think you are good, but from God's point of view, you are not. So we're going to look at a couple of things, basically three things that causes you to stand still, go around the same mount, mountain, get frustrated because the Lord is not moving. Um, or you can be moving very well, and then the Lord will stop, and you'll think the Lord is still with you because how many know if you let your foot off the gas pedal, the car still moves yeah. Yeah. because of momentum, yeah. but then it'll start slowing down. Mm -hmm. So Isaiah 59, 1 through 4, listen, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save you nor is his ear too deaf to hear you call. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away and will not listen anymore. This is somebody that is actively living that way, not somebody that fell into something or made a mistake. He said, your hands are the hands of murderers. You can do that with your heart, your mouth, and your hands. And your fingers are filthy with sin. Your lips are full of lies, and your mouth spews corruption. No one cares about being fair and honest, and the people's lawsuits are based on lies. They conceive evil deeds and then give birth to sin. Let me say something, for example, because I'm dealing with that right now. Uh, you know, it's amazing. The scripture says this. It says, don't sue another Christian. I'm, amazing. I'm amazed at how when Christians are done wrong, they just decide to just blatantly disobey that scripture. It says, don't sue another Christian. It says, don't bef go before the heathen, heathen to display your foolishness. And then it says right after that, why can't you just allow yourself to be done wrong? That's what it says. And people don't care about that. Okay, I, I got a situation right now. Person was supposed to give us a certain amount of equipment, gave them a certain amount of money, and um, no equipment. <laughs> a long time. Even though we reached out. No reach back. The person is actively working in other places. I'm not even going to call the individual. You know, but, but those are, you, you, there's certain things that you shouldn't do according to the scripture. You know, it says, don't, you, watch this. You have to allow yourself to be wrong, but God will make it right another way if you do what the word says. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, it just, that's why I decided to bring that up when it comes to lawsuits. You know, don't do people wrong. And, and when people do you wrong, you have to pray about how far you want to go. I understand that they owe you money, but maybe you should just let it go. This person owes us certain things. I'm just letting it go. I ain't got time to chunt you down. If you want to do us wrong and you're good with your conscience, good, because the Lord has sent it another way. Y'all got that? So that's one way, is that just living in sin, and, and when you live in sin too long, you can think you're right. 
uh, you know, it's, it's amazing. People say, hey, I just want to go up in life. I want my life to turn around. I want to do this, and I want to do that. And then I'll bring something to their attention. Well, um, in that case, uh, you have to stop this right here. Then they get offended and leave. I don't chase them. Because if, if you won't do that one thing, Judges 7, 2 through 8, the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many, this is a second reason, and a third, by the way. You have too many warriors with you. If I let all of you fight the Midianites, the Israelites will boast to me that they saved themselves by their own strength. <laughs> Therefore, tell the people, whoever is timid or afraid, y'all can go on home right now. <laughs> 22,000 people, 22,000 of them went home, leaving only 10,000 who were willing to fight. That's crazy, isn't it? You about to go to war and three quarters of your army doesn't want to fight. Okay, but then the second group is even more dangerous. But the Lord told Gideon, there are still too many. Bring them down to the spring and I will test them to determine who will go with you and who will not. When Gideon took his warriors down to the water, the Lord told him, divide the men into two groups, 150 apiece. And one group put all those, I'm sorry, I made a mistake with saying that. I was talking too fast and thinking too fast. Divide the men into two groups. And one group put all those who cup water in their hands and lap it up with their tongues like dogs. Ain't paying attention to nothing. And the other group put all those who kneel down and drink with their mouths in the stream. Only 300 of the men drank from their hands. All the others got down on their knees and drank with their mouths in the stream. They just stuck their head in the water. <clears throat> the Lord told Gideon, with these 300, I will rescue you and give you victory over the Midianites. Send all the others home with those that were afraid. So Gideon collected the provisions and ram's horns of the other warriors, sent them home, but he kept the 300 men with him. The Midianite camp was in the valley just below Gideon. I mean, I know, remember the movie 300, okay? Well, this 300, they were even crazier than that 300 that you saw at the movies, okay? But um, so the Bible makes that clear in regards to how God feels about certain things, okay? One is sin. Second thing, okay, you're not in sin, but you're too afraid. So there are certain things that won't come your way because Noah knows that you're going to have to face a giant in order to stand there. I mean, think about it. The children of Israel wouldn't go into the promised land. Why? Because of fear. God was taking them from slavery to millionaire status overnight. Your, your fear wouldn't allow you to go in. So fine, you're going to wander in the wilderness. There are many people that are wandering around in circles simply because they don't have enough boldness to face something. I understand that you want a business. But God may not bring you that business if you're too afraid to make decisions. You understand what I'm saying? So that was one. We understand that. Afraid, go home. 22,000. Got 10,000 left. And then what's crazy is 9,700 of them had a mentality that God said, I cannot use. And he said, you know how we can tell? What? Small things. We can determine their mentality just by how they drink water. It's crazy. He said, and so how they drink water will determine how they will carry themselves in the battle. So this group, watch this, they are fearless, they are sinless, and they want to fight, but I won't let them because of their mentality. So send them home. How did I go from 30,000 to, to, to 300? That's how it is. Always let you know God doesn't lead a large number of people. See, that's what's going on in the body of Christ right now. The Lord's sending a bunch of preachers home. That's why this stuff is not working. Amen. Your, your mentality will mess you up, y'all. It's a lot of people that are supposed to have a business. There are people that are supposed to have an invention. You could handle the invention. You couldn't handle the discipline and the legal side that you're supposed to stay on top of. Do you know that if you are a person that is very rarely timely, that things are he held from you? Things don't, y'all, ooh, let me, ooh, this is, ah, I'm feeling bad now, and I'm, uh, I'm letting you, it, how many know the Bible says it's the small foxes yes. that spoil the vine? Let's read Hebrews chapter 12. I see this is probably going to be a commentary less sermon. <laughs> if you're a first time visitor, we usually have fun and deep revelation and laughing and, and we're doing all type of stuff. Not today. You can come back tonight and get your shot on. Hebrews 12 5. Have you forgotten the encouraging words spoken to you as children? He said, 
My child, pay attention to this. This is for everybody. Because some people have a hard time with this. My child, don't underestimate the value of the discipline and training of the Lord God. Or get depressed when he has to correct you. For the Lord's training of your life is the evidence of his faithful love. And when he draws you to himself, it proves that you are his delightful child. Fully embrace God's correction as part of your training. For he is doing what any loving father does for his children. Who has ever heard of a child who never had to be corrected? We all should welcome God's discipline as the validation of authentic sonship. For if we have never once endured his correction, it only proves that we are strangers and not sons. Notice they said, he didn't say hear correction, endure it. And isn't it true that we respect our earthly fathers, even though they correct us and made us pick out our own switches from the tree? then we should demonstrate an even greater respect for God, our spiritual father, as we submit to his life-giving discipline. Our parents corrected us for the short time of our childhood as it seemed good to them, but God corrects us throughout our lives for our own good, giving us an invitation to share his holiness. This has to do with your eternal reward, in other words. I'm disciplining you so that when you get to the other side, you can get more stuff. Now, all discipline seems to be more pain than pleasure at the time. Everybody say amen. amen. Yet later, it will produce a transformation of character, bringing a harvest of righteousness and peace to those who will yield to the discipline and not fight against it. Hey, okay? y'all got that. So, I'm going to put this statement here so you can find yourself in a particular category. Because you may be a part of a great church, but the question is, are you a great person? Are you a worker in God's kingdom or an observer? Are you a server or a slacker? Are you faithful or fickle? Can we count on you or do we have to count you out? Are you a co-laborer or a complainer? Are you a team player? or a team agitator? Are you here to see how much you can add or how much you can take away? Those two mentalities determine what you get from heaven and how far you advance. And this is where you want to find yourself is in 2 Timothy 2.20. This is the reason why God is chastising you and disciplining you and telling you stuff that you just don't want to hear. In a wealthy home, how many know God has a wealthy home? Amen. Jesus said this, in my father's house, are many mansions. So everyone's home in heaven is in God's house, not in heaven. That's how big heaven is, that everybody's house is in his home. In a wealthy home, some utensils are made of gold, silver, and some are made of wood and clay. The expensive utensils are used for special occasions. And the cheap ones are for everyday use. He's talking about people. Let that sink in. He ain't talking about Thanksgiving dinner, folk. He's talking about people. You can, watch this. The whole group is going to be used. But some of you, because of how you carry yourself, I can use you for more special things. Y'all know what I'm saying? See, for guys that's in the football or basketball, you'd rather be an assistant coach than the water boy. Anybody can be the water boy. <laughs> oh, y'all looking like. Verse 21, if you keep yourself pure, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean. And watch this. You will be ready for the master to use you for every good work on the other side. Ooh wee. So the question is, do you want to be just a regular utensil in heaven used by God for regular stuff? 
or you want to be used for special stuff. I want to be one of those ones when God is getting ready to do something crazy and something special. I want my name to be a list. Go get this person, this person, get this person. Make sure you get Otha. Make sure you get him. Matter of fact, if you can't get nobody else, get him. That's what I want. How many of y'all want that? You always got a few people. Oh, no. I'm just wonderful being a doorkeeper in the house of God. I'm not doing all of this to be a doorkeeper anywhere. I'm just the one that welcomes people to heaven. Come on in. I ain't got nothing. But I might as well. Man, I, I'm not doing that. Everybody say, I'm getting mine. <laughs> and the Lord says here, though, but if you're going to get yours, he said, you'll get more based on how willing you are to receive chastisement about the flies that are in your personal ointment. <laughs> Remember verse 21? Look at, he said, you got to keep yourself pure. How many of you know? We all love pure oil, pure perfume. How many of you know? It's not pure if there's a dead bug in it. So the things in your life that you refuse to change and you refuse to listen to, God sees that as flies in the beautiful perfume or ointment. So he's not chastising you even because so much of the flies. He's chastising you because he wants you to get really, really as pure as possible because there are some things on the other side that you have had to have done on this side. you like, you watch this, a portal opens and you just look into dimension. Can I go there? Mm -mm. You weren't pure enough before you got here to be able to have access to that. That's for special folk. I need portable. I need portals opening up, and I'm moving too slow. And she's like, "What you waiting on? Let's go!" Man, I'm telling y'all, gonna be so upset when y'all go to heaven. Y'all gonna be so upset. And Jesus gonna tell you, your pastor tried to tell you it wasn't religious up here. Let's look at the scripture, Ecclesiastes 10:1. As dead flies cause even a bottle of perfume to stink. So a little foolishness spoils great wisdom and honor. Now, how many of you know, out here in these streets, Lionheart Church is beginning to be known as a ministry of wisdom, honor, and power. Would you agree? But the Bible says when it comes to people that are known for their wisdom and honor and power, a little foolishness in your midst will cause all of that to stink. You understand me? Yes. And one of the things that you find about God, he's real big about stuff that he smells. Mm -hmm. When you study the Old Testament, every time they gave a, 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 a sacrifice, it says it would be a sweet savior in the nostrils of the Lord. You, most people don't know this. And as an individual, you smell a particular way. Yes. I know two people that they have a particular gifting, just like I don't want to say the X-Men, but they have a particular gifting where if you are living, uh, uh, I met one, he was a security guard. I worked a security job right before I became a pastor. And it was a, it was a young kid, about in his 20s. And um, when he found out that I was a Christian, he's like, can I share something with you? I said, what? I said, oh, here comes some craziness. I always, they always, people always know, see that guy over there in the corner, minding his own business? Mm -hmm. He seemed like we can tell him something crazy. <laughs> I just, I just, and the Lord sends him because they need to know they're not crazy. They think they're crazy. Right, right. And so they talk to me. You mean to tell me I'm saying and everybody else is crazy? Mm-hmm. Okay. And so he said, man, I got this like gift. He said, you know how I knew you were tight? I said, how? Oh. He said, because of the way you smell. He said, if a person is not living right, he said, they smell a particular way. And he said, it's the nastiest stench ever. And he said, I don't like it. He said, but I can tell. You never have to tell me if you're a Christian or not. You have to tell me anything. He said, you just smell a particular way. Mm -hmm. And the Bible talks about your life being a sweet savor perfume. Y'all yes. got me? Yes. Amen. Woo. Amen. So let me give you an example. I shared this Wednesday, but a lot of people were here. They didn't hear it. At the baptism, <laughs> y'all going to have to split them kids apart, Janice. <laughs> Put Isaiah in the back row. <laughs> kids back there arguing over, oh yeah, put them up. No, Lord, they're fighting over the little electronic instruments. 
don't, if you got four kids, don't bring out one instrument. Okay, you got to bring out four. Anyway, I'm just messing with them. It's an interactive congregation. During the baptism a couple of weeks ago, last weekend, there was a young lady there that said something to me. She said, I didn't know you knew such and such. You know? I was like, oh, wow, you know him? She said, yeah, that's a friend of mine, a longtime friend. I said, oh, you know, and, uh, you know, and they said, and she said, yeah, they told me that they used to do such such here. I said, that's not true. And, and so, <laughs> and so when she said that, it like, you, you ever think something is dead on the inside of you and then somebody says the wrong thing and that thing resurrects from the dead? I'm back. So when she said that, the person said, such, such, such. that's not true. I said, I did it this way. I said, first of all, that's not true. That's how I did it. And so I just began to share certain things that I thought, well, okay, well, no, that person, you know, they kind of did some things that weren't good, caused people to leave the church. And, and so I didn't go in, but I just said, hey, you know, he, no, he, good guy, but he was full of pride. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, so I shared that with her. And so then, uh, I think it was a couple of days later, Oh, the Holy Spirit does this. <clears throat> uh oh. And uh, why did you think it was okay to share that information with her? And see, when the Holy Spirit talks to me, that's, that's all He has to say. I understand? Oh, I was wrong. Mm -hmm. So, since you recognize you were wrong, you also need to recognize you're going to call her back and apologize. Now, so I'll call the young lady back and I said, Remember the conversation that we had? after the baptism of all things. We didn't just gloriously celebrate you and now how I am, you know, running my mouth about that situation. So you remember the, what, the conversation about baptism? She said, yeah, I said, I just owe you an apology. I said, I just, I never should have brought that up. I said, I was feeling a little salty when you brought that up and so I just kind of lost it for a second and so I just wanted to apologize. I should have never said that to you because he's a good person. He was just got off with some things so I just wanted to apologize. Now, here's the flat, here, watch this. She said, Oh, you didn't do anything wrong. You're good. Well, if I'm good, then why did God call me and tell me to apologize? That's the difference between you thinking you're good and God knowing you're not. That's the difference between, oh, it's not that deep. Yes, it is. She thought that there was, uh, she, watch this, the woman, the human being, that's what the Bible says, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. She didn't think I had done a thing wrong. She said, well, she said, I knew that the person was off, you know, and that don't mean that what I did was right. right, right. See, so this is, I'm trying to help you understand how, how we view things versus how God view things. She thought I was good. God was like, you got flies in the ointment that you need to get out by apologizing. Okay. See the difference? Okay. And so if you're not willing to receive chastisement from God, all you're telling him is just use me as a regular person in heaven. Don't give me anything honorable. How many of you had to receive ch chastisement when you played sports? How many of you, you made the mistake of hiring a trainer when it came to losing weight and getting in shape? And that was the most horrible decision you ever made in your life because all they did was talk about your lazy behind, get up, you wanted to stop, nope, do two more. Everybody swears they can do it on their own. Y'all saw even Creed, he tried to do it on his own but he needed Rocky. We see that with every, everything else. How many know when you started on your job, you made a mistake and you had to be corrected? Right, right. Some of us made so many mistakes, it came with an oral warning, and then a written warning, and we never got the point. And so it came with a pink slip. And then at the next interview, why'd you leave the last job? Oh, irreconcilable differences, you know. It just Their vision was not in line with... And I know you're lying, but we don't have anybody else to hire, so go ahead and start tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. That was Baptist Church right there. Did you see how he picked that boy up and carried him out like it was a log? Eric picked his son up and carried him out like he was a log. Oh, you're going to stop today. Ooh, this is bringing back memories. I mean, you know, back in the day, we did not have a children's church. And it was amazing. The kids weren't hollering and screaming because they got them evil looks from their parents. All it took was a look. Hmm. So that's an example on how maybe the Lord can't get to you because you have this wall up. 
You don't believe you owe certain people an explanation. You don't believe you owe certain people an apology. And there's some of them that you owe people an apology because of how you carry yourself with them. Some of you owe people an apology concerning what you have told them about others. You didn't like someone, so you shared it with someone else what you don't like about that individual. Okay? No, no parent enjoys their children at strife with one another. If I walk downstairs and one of my kids was secretly telling one of the other kids about how raggedy one of the other kids are, I'm not getting ready to tolerate that. And yet we think our Heavenly Father is good with this and we're going to a place where everybody is, love with each, is in love with each other at all times. It's the most difficult thing because we are in a society where that's all everyone does. Oh, man. You didn't like what you had to do for someone else, so you gossiped and complained. And then we think we're okay with God. And these are called flies in the ointment. And how many know, when a fly first drops into something, you know, it's still alive. Then eventually it dies. Then it starts to putrefy. So, so this is what it is about these things on the inside of us. We think we good at first. But this thing is secretly on the side of you just turning. I mean, I want you to tell you, I want you to think about this. God is telling you that that side of you, he said, is the equivalent of a dead fly. That's nasty. And that's how it looks from heaven. That's nasty. And most flies in the ointment have to do with how we treat people, judge people, and talk to people. I mean, no, it's a good thing we read that scripture about how God is only doing this to prepare us for the other side. He loves us. And see, I had to read that scripture first. Otherwise, people are like, Psh, I didn't come to hear this. Yes, you did. Luke 6, 27. <laughs> yeah. See, you, even the little dog ain't saying amen. He know not to say nothing. He like, I don't appreciate this. I don't know why I just love making fun of things. Whoever has a little dog, you got to introduce him as a first-time visitor when we come down. <laughs> you know, yeah, the church needs to be a place of, of, you know, never mind. There are some people that would actually sit up there and say, you can't have no animal up in the house of God. Why? They're going to be in heaven? Ooh. They're allowed in heaven, but they ain't allowed at the church. Now, don't come here next week with your cat, though. Just because I said that, you know, it's a purpose for your cat needing to be here. You know, maybe he need deliverance because the cat keeps slapping people or something. <laughs> we ain't about to have a ministry towards animals where we praying for goldfish because they got a bowl on their head. And, and you know what I'm saying. Luke 6, 27. Mm, here we go. Y'all ready? But to watch now, now watch how he prefaces this. But to you who are willing to listen, because some of y'all are not going to be willing to. But to you who are willing to listen, I say, he started out wrong. Love your enemies. Oh, boy. And for y'all to read the Bible, his definition of love when it comes to your enemies is what you find in 1 Corinthians 13. Do good to those who hate you. We won't even do good to those who get on our nerves. He said, do, see, now all of these things that you are unwilling to do, these are all flies. <laughs> um, Terry is going through, she's like, oh, ooh. <laughs> Bless those who curse me? Mm. I'm thinking about myself on that one. Because, you know, I'll be looking for an opportunity for a witch or a wizard to try to curse me. And there's a time for that, but, you know, never mind. Pray, oh, Lord. Pray for those who hurt you. Mm -hmm. And until you can do this, you have not done anything. Because you know what people are doing? They either bypass in the scripture or they read it and then don't do it. If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks. And when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. That's the reason why the person that did is wrong. I'm not calling the individual. Do, here's the master scripture. 
do to others as you would like them to do to you if you were in their situation. I am, an, um, I am amazed at how people won't do that. They can see somebody in a situation and they will not do that scripture. The Lord says, now when you see that person, yes, switch places with them and what would you want to be done to you if you were them? If you were the homeless guy on a corner holding a sign, switch places and you're the homeless guy holding up the sign. What would you want to be done? And this right here is what you call raw Christianity. This is the stuff that runs heaven, where you are nothing but a slave to others. You live your, and let me tell you something, that's not always going to feel good. Okay, I spend my life mostly just helping other people every single area it does not always feel good because you're going to constantly feel taken advantage of not appreciated but when you get to the other side then they'll wonder why i'm a king Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you only let me go back to verse 32 i don't need to be skipping nothing do unto others as you would have them do unto you if you love only those who love you why should you get credit for that You ain't doing nothing. Even sinners do that. They love who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. You ain't doing nothing. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Now watch this. Notice with all three of those things, you're going to get some type of credit. But if you only do it for those that you like, what, what credit are you going to get? Even sinners will lend to other sinners if they know you're going to give it back. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to, oh Lord, this hurts. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven, see everything is based on a reward. So the reason why he's asking you to do something this hard, he's telling you, look, there are multiplying factors to getting greater rewards in heaven. The greatest rewards in heaven come to do, come about by doing the most difficult things in planet Earth. So if you're willing to try this at home, if you're willing to listen, if you're willing to go down this path of being held in huge and high honor and regard in heaven, do this stuff, and then he says, your reward in heaven will be what? He didn't say great. He said your reward in heaven would be very great. And you will truly be acting as children of the Most High because he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. I mean, I know we have a lot of work to go. You must be compassionate just as your father is compassionate. I don't like people that can't have compassion on others that don't have what they have. It's a very much a turn off to me. Do not, oh man, we might need to get saved, y'all. Do not judge others and you will not be judged. See, you looked at the first part, I looked at the second. If you don't want me to judge you, then you don't judge others. That's a crazy scripture, y'all. So guess what? How you judge others is how I'm going to judge you. Let me just read the rest. Do not judge others and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others or it will all come back against you. Forgive others and you will be forgiven. Give and you will receive. See, they always pull out that scripture and they didn't do none of the rest. Because if they read the rest, then you wouldn't give. Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more. How many of you heard that scripture? Running over and pressed down into your lot. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And they always took that one scripture out by itself and they never read the rest because if they read the rest first, you would walk out the church. I ain't giving. I ain't coming to hear this mess about I need to change. Y'all got that? See, these scriptures need to be the ones you read every day. But we don't read those every day. That's why we don't change. Because the Bible says the love of God will control you. Control you. This is the stuff that I'm in. I'm not in, you know, we've been in prophecy and, and giftings and money and all that type of things. But this is the stuff that runs heaven. 
This is the stuff that God cares about because you got to do this. You don't have to do the gifting that gave that to you. Right. Speaking in tongues, your salvation, all of those things, the ability to interpret dreams, all of deliverance, that's God's power. We do all of that stuff here. He gave us, I give you authority over them all. I gave that to you. But character, you got to develop. And for those that develop character, they are revered the highest in heaven. Not some, watch this. If you have an individual that can raise 10 people from the dead, but this individual here does not walk in power, but they have the ability to forgive 10 people, God is looking at this person and ignoring the other one. I'm not impressed with your ability to raise somebody from the dead because it wasn't your power. It was mine. But this individual, they had to have intestinal fortitude and hold back the tears and get over the attitude and forgive 10 people that did them wrong. Yeah, we got a special place for them. That's one of those utensils we can use as a diamond in heaven. Ooh, this is some good stuff. You should be shouting right now. I'm gonna be like my previous pastor. He said, I'm gonna shout myself. I'm gonna run around. I'm gonna take this coat off and just swing it like Benny Hinn. Hallelujah. <laughs> Matthew 7, 1 through 5. He said it again. Do not judge others. It's a promise attached to this. And you won't be judged. I don't even know how far that goes. I do know it goes to the gates of heaven. Can you imagine that some people have done some things wrong? Oh, God. They did some things wrong to you, and you just covered it with love. Then when you stand before the Lord, he says, now you did these people wrong, but I'm not allowed to judge you in that matter. I have to let it go because of how you treated them. He said, if you don't judge, you won't be. Is that the Bible? Am I just inventing stuff? Amen. Do you all realize how powerful that is? That's. Amen. And yet we turn right around and read that and go right back to judging people. That's hard. That's why it comes with a great reward. Watch this. Verse 2. For you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you be judged. That's why I try to be really nice to people even when they make mistakes. That's why I practice this stuff. Because according to this scripture, you are creating your own standard of judgment at the throne of God. There is a... I'm going to read it again for myself. Do not judge others and you will not be judged. For you will be treated as you treat others. That's dangerous. Because some of y'all are dealing with trouble from people, and it's because you caused the trouble yourself. You cause trouble for an individual, you can come up with any cockamamie excuse you want to. You cause trouble for an individual, you cause sadness in the individual, you in return must receive sadness. And it will hit you when you least expect it. For you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. Oh, here we go. This is my favorite. Un this is my unfavorite part. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you got a log in yours? Now, notice he didn't say some of y'all. It implies here that all y'all got a log. <laughs> How can you even think of saying to your friend? Let me help you get rid of that speck in your life when you can't see past the log in your own eye. Hypocrite. Jesus cracked me up calling people on their name. First get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Character problems cause you to be very blind. And you swear you can see the other person's issue. And the Lord is saying, no, nope. until you become pure, you will always see the other individual incorrectly. Always. I used to be the total opposite. Now I look at, I always want to find out about a person's past. We, we're trained to judge people based on what they're doing in the moment. I want to know what is it about the past that's making them behave this way in the moment. But some people don't care about that. And so because you don't care about that, give it time, somebody won't care about you. Yes, yes. 
I can't read that again because it's just, it's just, you need to read this. You need to memorize these. So watch this. You got this big old thing. And guess what? It's, let me tell y'all something. You know why that's so hard? Always remember this. This is very, very important. Most people have never realized this. And that is, whatever is coming out of you, everybody feels it except you. If you're a rude individual, the other person feels that rudeness. You don't feel it because it came out of you, but it hit them. And so this is the reason why people can bring to your attention, hey, you, you carrying yourself a particular way. I'm not doing that. You swear up and down you're not. Number one, because you're blind. And number two, because you don't feel it because it came out of you. So, th so that's the reason, watch this. That's the reason why somebody can say, hey, lower your voice. You, you, you raised your voice. And you say, I didn't raise my voice. I didn't raise my voice. You know why you don't think you raised your voice? Because when you raised it, it didn't hit you. It hit them. What's coming out of you hits the other individual. It never hits you because it came out of you. You understand what I'm saying? So a hundred people can tell you that you did this and you did it in anger. I didn't do that in anger. Everybody felt the anger except for you. You got what I'm saying? So if you don't actively look in your life and willing to listen to people around you that can point out the things that are bad about your character, uh, you got a dead fly in your perfume. That ain't no perfume. That's just an after accent in the shape of, you know how we ju try to justify stuff. Y'all right, right. looking at me, y'all like, mm, mm, mm. This, mm, this is all of us. Amen. Is it going to the next one? Luke 10, 25. Just then, a religious scholar stood before Jesus in order to test his doctrines. I get that a lot. He posed this question, teacher, what requirement must I fulfill if I want to live forever in heaven? Jesus said, what does Moses teach? What do you read in the law? The religious scholar answered, it states, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your passion, all your energy, and every thought. And you must mm, love your neighbor as well as you love yourself. Most people don't do that. Jesus said, that's correct. Now go and do exactly that and you'll live. In other words, get up out of here asking me these stupid questions when the answer was already in the law. It's simple. Love your neighbor the way you love yourself. Yes, amen. Ooh, yeah, that's why I'm not looking at nobody because I don't want nobody thinking that I'm talking to them, you know. So I can, I can do something like this. So you need to take care of your bad attitude. See, if I happen to look at her, she's like, oh, 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 you saw me in the parking lot before I came in. No, I didn't. So I'm looking at the wall so nobody get offended. See, when he made that statement, he looked at me. I had to look at somebody. Maybe I should just put a mirror up here. When I make those statements, I move the mirror. 1 Corinthians 13. Uh-oh. If I were to speak with eloquence in earth's many languages and in the heavenly tongues of angels speaking in tongues, yet I didn't express myself with love, my words would be reduced to the hollow sound of nothing more than a clanging cymbal. Ooh, I wonder how much of our tongues, ooh. And if I were to have the gift of prophecy with a profound understanding of God's hidden secrets, and if I possessed unending supernatural knowledge, and if I had the greatest gift of faith, we would be impressed with this individual. We pay money to go see him in the conference. And if I had the greatest gift of faith that I could move mountains, but have never learned to love, I am nothing. That's why it's a lot of people going to heaven that did miracles, and Jesus is going to say, I don't know who you are, but I raised somebody from the dead, and I'm supposed to be impressed? Cast it on a demon. Whatever. Unbelievers cast out demons. In case y'all didn't know that. Remember what Jesus said? He said, your own exorcists do it, and then you sitting up here judging me? He called them exorcists. And they wouldn't, you remember that? Never mind, I don't need to bring that up. What verse am I in? Y'all like, yeah, move it down. Don't be making no mistake going back up. And if I were to be so generous as to give away everything I own to feed the poor and to offer my body to be burned as a martyr without the pure motive of love, I would gain nothing of value, which means that if you do that in love, you gain something of value. Here it is. Love is large. And incredibly patient. Love is gentle. 
and consistently kind to all. In other words, it doesn't treat this person one way and then treat this person another way. I'm going to hold a certain standard for you because you're my best friend. But this person over here that gets on my nerve, I got a different standard. Y'all with me on this wonderful, joyous, peaceful, glorious. <laughs> they ain't even saying nothing. They're not saying nothing. I need that dog to start barking right now. I really do. I need that. And if oh, love is large, incredibly patient, love is gentle and consistently kind of all, it refuses to be jealous. Which means some situations, it's a temptation to be jealous, but you refuse to be. When blessing comes to someone else, love does not brag about one's achievements, nor inflate its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame and disrespect, nor selfishly seek its own honor. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. It didn't say you couldn't be irritated. It says you're not easily irritated. See, most people are like, yes, amen, but you easily irritated, so don't be yes, amen, and nothing. Y'all still with me? Y'all gonna come back next week? Y'all gonna give to Zimbabwe? All right. It's not their fault that I'm making y'all mad this morning. Love celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter. It never stops believing the best for others. Believing the best for others. The best for others. Love never takes failure as defeat, and it never gives up. Y'all got that? All of those things in those categories, if you refuse to start practicing that, that's you leaving flies in the ointment. And then the old, this is the reason why a lot of people, the older they get, the worse they become. It's supposed to be the older you get, the nicer you become. I cannot tell me, tell you how many times I have run into older people in traffic and at the grocery store. And I'm like, Lord, please don't let it be me. Don't let it be me. What happened? These are people that had oil, they had flies in their ointment, flies in their perfume. And month by month. It just festered. The next thing you know, you're an old person that claimed that you love Jesus and got the most funkiest, nastiest attitude in planet Earth. Yes. Well, praise Jesus and then cuss you out in the next moment. Mm. Mm. And when they start driving, it's terrible. They have no patience when they come to drive. Somebody honked at me the other day. Why are you honking at me? I can't run into the truck. <laughs> so I really want to get one of those Big, I don't know, what, is it cow horns? Ha! Not going to be the 18, that's what I need. But I know if I get one of those, I'm going to be in trouble. I can tell you that right now. I know I'm going to be in trouble. Okay. See, y'all got that. So let's finish it just with these few scriptures. Ooh, y'all really? Yeah, yeah. I put the knife in your knee. I got to twist it a little bit. But you can handle it. You know what the Bible says? It says God will bruise you and then heal you after you learn the lesson. Y'all like, oh, I don't need those lessons, Jesus. Just, Hallelujah. yeah, but you know what? Guess what? Those lessons are only for the disobedient. Mm. You're supposed to get it yeah. and, and, and adjust to what is right and make the decision. Yeah. But if you won't, the Lord says, okay, well, let's send them down the longer path. Second Corinthians 4, 4, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. We've always used that scripture when it comes to unbelievers. The reason why they're not saved is because they're blind. Mm -hmm. And the reason why you won't do the scriptures that I just mentioned is because you're blind. Mm -hmm. Satan didn't stop to say you got saved. That's when he turned up. He knows how important character is to God. He knows that that's the most important thing to God. He knows that the more you have excellent character and love everybody the same, the more you're acting like your heavenly father. So he is the one that is behind blinding your mind so that you won't do this stuff and just make excuses. Now read, I'm going to just read these scriptures and I got some bullet points. We are human, 2 Corinthians 10.3. We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. I love that phrase. 
we use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning, coming up with a reason why I can't do what the Lord told me to do. And then we destroy false arguments. You want to argue about why you shouldn't have to do what the word says because you just don't want to do it. So you have an argument, but heaven says your argument is false. Second Corinthians 10, five, we're going down. Thank you, Jesus, for the dance ministry tonight so we can shake all of this off and get back to our senses. Second Corinthians 10, five, casting down imaginations. Why well, you got to cast it down? Because the enemy put it there. There's nothing worse than rolling with an imagination that somebody else put in your mind. Yeah. And every high thing, everyone say pride, pride, that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Everyone say next. next. Second Corinthians, same scripture from the Passion Translation. For although we live in the natural realm, we don't wage a military campaign using human weapons, using manipulation to achieve our aims. Instead, our spiritual weapons are energized with divine power to effectively dismantle, watch this, the defenses behind which people hide. Well, I can't really forgive them because that would make me vulnerable. Yeah, that's called a false defense and a false argument. You reason yourself out of being better. We can demolish every deceptive fantasy. Mm. Fantasy, that don't mean that you didn't come up with something that's in the category of pornography. Sometimes your fantasy is something that you want to happen to someone so that you don't have to be bothered with them anymore. <laughs> that opposes God and break through every, oh Lord, arrogant attitude that is raised up like the Bruce Lee fist in defiance of the true knowledge of God. We capture like, this is some we capture like prisoners of war every thought and insist that it bow in obedience to the anointed one. Since we are armed with such dynamic weaponry, we stand ready to punish any trace of rebellion as soon as you choose complete obedience. Complete. So put up this graphic. Got this graphic and then one scripture. Hallelujah. You should take a picture of this, write this down, Stamp it to your forehead. The scripture is very clear. Do it or receive the negative ramifications in your life that you will never see coming. Love your enemies. It's not an argument. It's not a choice. You're either going to do it or you're not. You're going to treat everybody the same. You're going to love everybody the same. You're going to do the right thing or you're not. It's very simple. I love it up to you. I set before you blessing and cursing. And in case you're stupid, choose blessing so that you and your seed may live because your bad character is going to affect your children. That little thing that you won't change is going to rub off on one of them. Think about it. As adults, we're dealing with stuff from our parents. Y'all know what I'm saying? I mean, no, this is a hard message, but it's the truth. And the Bible says only the truth makes you feel, makes you free. It may not make you feel good at first. But the truth is designed and engineered to make you free. These are the seven things that people tap into so that they don't have to obey the love of Jesus Christ. Human reasoning. I shouldn't have to do this. That's human reasoning. Why shouldn't you have to do it? The Bible ain't written to a selective group of people. People crack me up. Well, it's a different standard for preachers. Where is that scripture at? Uh, no, there's not a different standard. The standard of the Bible is the same for all. The difference is in order to preach, you got to be meeting the standard. Y'all understand what I'm saying? That's the only difference. Human reasoning. Arguing with people about why you shouldn't have to do something. But heaven says it's false. Imaginations. That one is a killer. Because then you imagine, your imagination will run wild. Man, and see, and see, see, if you're outside of the word of God, Satan will grab hold to your imagination and produce thoughts. And your hatred for a person will be based on the fact 
that he has grabbed a hold of your mind and he's producing these imaginations. These imaginations. It was so crazy, y'all. Let me show you how dangerous this can be. Social media is very dangerous. It is very much dangerous. I'm not a jealous individual. I'm not an envious individual. I'm good with my own. I know where we're going. I know what the Lord has connected us to. He's connected us to the best. I made the mistake on social media and there was a little, it was a praise and worship team that was doing a set and I clicked on it. And they, and this church is kind of known for being more image, not substance, but image. Um, and so it was really cool how they were doing praise and worship and, and they had cameras going in between the people and, and, and all of that. And, and the way the cameras were set up and the lighting and I looked at that thing and then some spirit of depression attached itself to me for two hours, you know? It, 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 you never see it coming. I could look at anybody else's church and everybody's on different levels, on different roles, and for some reason, when I looked at that, maybe that's the spirit on that ministry. Because that ministry is known for trying to be better than everybody. And so maybe because I was looking at it, that thing jumped on me and I felt bad because I couldn't do what they do, which is what? A camera angle? You, sh you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. You see, I like to use myself as examples because this is how slick this stuff is, where now you're sitting up here and, and you're feeling down because, because of what? Here you are, you have established by the grace and mercy of God, you have established the entire Bible back. We are one of the few churches that do everything in Scripture. Amen. Then the Lord connected us to the baddest church in the planet, hands down, yes, yes. cranking, building the largest sanctuary in the world. Give us what he gave us over there. I don't know if I should be sharing that publicly. And all of the things that we're doing, they moved us over. There. We're doing, watch this, doing the work of the ministry, but depressed because you don't have the style of ministry. What is style? Did Jesus worry about style? You know, he was so worried about style, he had a man that looked like Tarzan representing his ministry out there eating bugs. What type of representative is this? Y'all couldn't come up with nobody better than this. Somebody hanging out in the wilderness with a loincloth on looking like Tarzan eating grasshoppers. That's The Bible says that's the only thing he ate. Yeah, I would have been a wonderful fat. Like I talk, that's nasty to me. You, you got grasshoppers stuck in your teeth. This, that's how I read the Bible, day. Are y'all following me this morning? I use myself as examples because nobody has diplomatic immunity in this area. Satan will locate your weakness and then exploit that sucker so that you will lose because he's already a loser. And you'll find yourself in one of those categories because the word says to do this. But you got some type of human reasoning, some type of false argument. Your pride kicks in. You got to defend yourself because in order to do this for somebody else, it got to make you feel vulnerable because they might hurt you. You are called to be hurt. Remember that. Ain't no such thing as a Christian that's free from hurt. You are called to let people hurt you so that they can take your healing. It's a principle of the kingdom. Jesus took my infirmity so that he could give me it's the law of exchange again and as, well, you, you're so worried about somebody hurting you that you can't produce healing for them there are sometimes you're supposed to take a blow y'all yeah. understand what I'm saying yeah. we ain't trained that way yeah. Yeah. that's just type of crazy deceptive fantasies arrogant attitudes how many of you know that's a lot of flies so the Lord looks at your life and he looks at you smiling and, and, and all of that type of stuff. And, he, and then watch this. And he looks at, you, looks at where you are. And that's, a, that's not a good statement for the Lord to tell me. It's flies and ointment. Y'all have produced oil. You've produced perfume. You've produced it. But the problem is that after it was produced, it's flies in it now. And those flies will determine who the Lord sends you. Always remember this. It is always the Lord's desire to send to you those that are broken the most. 
Remember that. God said, what? I'm close to those that are brokenhearted, contrite, folk who don't have anything. Do I dare you to do the Bible study on an orphan. You'll be so convicted you won't know what to do. Those are the ones the Lord wants to send, but he can only send those group to you. He only send that group to people who don't have a lot of flies in their ointment. You understand what I'm saying? So, we have a little bit of strength, like it says in the book of Revelation. Remember, remember what Jesus said? He said, if you produce a little bit, we'll cut you back a little bit. So you can produce more. Chastisement is the Lord cutting you back. Because you thought you were here, then he brings you revelation that shows you you actually here. And when you realize that, you work harder so that you can go higher. You understand what I'm saying? Whether you're married, whether you're children, whether you're parents, whether ministry, relationships, but it's all relationship based. I am, you know, and I'm, I'm, I have to be careful. I'm slow to say certain things a lot of, if you knew how much stuff I held, period, if you knew how much stuff I held, when I tell you there are some things I hold, I hold, I hold because of understanding and wisdom. There are things that I observe and I don't say anything because I know that I have to be slow to speak quick to watch and to listen because I can see something going on, but if I speak too early, I might assess it wrong. You understand what I'm saying? So, you know, I mean, no, I shared some very serious stuff this morning. And it's all about our character. Always remember this. Heaven is impressed with nothing except for your character. The Bible says, y'all, you think God cares about this world? This planet, our cars, our money, the food that we eat, it's all corrupted. Did you know everything that you wear and everything you eat is corrupted with some type of fly? You understand what I'm saying? We got molds on our faces. Some of us got glasses. glasses. All of these different type of things, these are flies in planet Earth. Never meant to exist. Handicaps to try to help us. And the Lord is looking, y'all have an eternity to live. And I need y'all to start being like me. The Bible says Jesus had to do it and blood was shed. The only thing you got to shed is your pride. And for some of you, in order to share your, shed your pride, it's the equivalent of Jesus being crucified. God will never be impressed with you. The, the things that the Lord does for people that get over into the mysterious realm, I am in no, you know good and well I am not a bragger. You know good and well that what I have, I don't understand why I have it. But there are no, I know that there are elements to what I have is because of how I carry myself with people, particularly those that are broken and don't have anything, didn't grow up like I grew up. And, and, and then, you know, the Holy Spirit had to remind me about things that I have done even before I was a pastor for people that others weren't willing to do. You know, there are little things like, you know, we, we're in a congregation of 5,000 people and that pastor and, you know, special speakers come and they have these books, you know, and they keep passing out books and then people stop waiting and they just run up to get a book. And so I think it was, I won't mention her name. Well, I mean, it don't make a difference. Her name is Mary Hickey. She was giving out books. She was giving out so many to one girl over here. She got up. She said, I'm just walking down. I'm going to get my, you know how people are, I'm going to get my blessing today. Her girl came right down here. And that pastor went off on that girl in front of the entire congregation. I'll never forget that. And the, and you're talking about a four or 5,000 seat arena. He went off on that girl in front of everybody because she desired the word and was willing to be bold and go get what she wanted to get. And he cut that girl down the way you cut a limb off of a tree. And the whole congregation went down. Cause she went back to her seat. She was sitting right behind me. And and I, you know, I just couldn't help it. I just kind of glanced and turned around. That girl, she was she was in another dimension. Yeah. Tears just coming down her. Yeah. Cause that dude made her feel so unworthy. Yeah. All she wanted was is to get closer to God. I need that book. And he made her feel like she was nothing. And so I have a low tolerance for that. Nobody decided to do anything, so I got up out of my seat, went to the bookstore, talked to the lady who was over the bookstore. I said, 
you got this particular book that Marilyn Hickey? She said, yeah, I got it. I said, just give me the book. She tr laid at the bookstore. She trusted me like that. I said, give me the book. I'll pay you later. She said, you're good. You know, I trust you. And so I just, and I wasn't doing it to be seen by anybody. But unfortunately, I had to do it in front of the whole 5,000 people. Thank God I was sitting right behind the pastor. So he's the only one that didn't see it. I walked right over and gave her that book. And it broke. She started crying more because then she saw the difference between a man and God's love. Yes, yes, yes. Now this one didn't want me to have it, but that one did. The devil used one man to take away, but then God made another man get up in front of everybody to give it back. You understand what I'm saying? And so that's how your love makes you understand that people are crazy, not God. People are. Just don't be that person that God has to look the other way because of how you treating one of his servants. I'm not going to heaven with that on my resume. Now, I might be going up there, you move too slow, you preach the wrong message, you clown too much in the pulpit. Wonderful. I can deal with that. What I can't deal with is the Lord showing me the faces of the people. And the worst thing in the world is, go get such and such person. You remember them? Oh, yeah. Roll the tape. Let's look at how you treated them in your heart, your mouth, and your mind based on what my word says. Then you got to watch yourself lose your reward. Then you got to apologize to that individual. And then you're going to treat them for eternity the way you were supposed to treat them on planet Earth. This is hard. But it's, def it's better for you to squirm in your seat and be convicted versus you go up there and it's too late. So guess what? If I had refused to call that girl and apologize to her, that would have been a fly in my ointment. That would have stayed there and been a judgment against me on the other side. Not to get into heaven, but had you done that right there, that was hard, son. This whole section over here would be for you. Well, what is it? We're not even going to tell you because it's none of your business because it's not yours. Wow. And when you see what they have up there, I close with this statement. The Bible says, I want you to think about this. How many of y'all have large imaginations? How many of you know when it comes to, to a mansion, some of y'all can think up some stuff? Oh, oh, it's a reason why I'm not playing the lottery to get that billion dollars because I know I'm going to lose my mind. I'm not going to lose my salvation. But, man, I'll create a floating sanctuary in midair. And everybody, man, I'll be flying all of y'all around the country. <laughs> they be kicking us out of Nigeria. All y'all can't come over here and get a house. What y'all doing? I mean, I'll act a fool with some money. Lord knows that. That's why he take me in stages because he knows me. Because I have such a zeal for the things of God that I will do stupid stuff to try to represent Jesus correctly. And he's like, no, no, just let me handle that. Remember, remember John the Baptist says, obvious I don't need that like that. You understand what I'm saying? I can't remember what I was saying, but you understand what I was saying that I can't remember. <laughs> I get caught up in my own stuff sometimes. But again, that's what I was saying is that the Bible says, it's never entered into your mind and it's never entered into your imagination what God has in store for you up there. Now I want you to think about that. So that means no matter what you can think up, they have gone way past that. So no matter what type of mansion that you could think up, that would be the most glorious and beautiful mansion in planet earth no matter what you think up into the category of a house heaven will be laughing at you right now look at them they think they're doing something they actually think they're doing something because they created a mansion the size of planet earth that changes every 24 hours and to another mansion that was more beautiful than the other one they actually think that they're doing something by creating that in their mind you haven't come close to us up here son has never entered into your mind or your imagination. What? Nobody can imagine it? Mm -mm. The same way that you can't imagine how the Holy Ghost is one individual, but in all y'all. 
Same way that you can't imagine that God never had a beginning. You cannot imagine what's up there. Just know. Do what's hard. Walk in the love of God. Treat people the way you would want to be treated. And when you do that, they are going to get on your nerves at times. That's why I said be long-suffering. Be patient. You know why? Because whatever long suffering you got to execute and institute for another individual doesn't come close to what I had to do for your slow moving behind. I'm in a different place because I know that what I have in my life I do not deserve. I don't. Ain't nothing I did as a kid to deserve my life. This is all the grace of God. And remember, some people get it more on this side. The Bible says this. It says some people get it more on this side, and it says, but those that get it on the other side, it can't be hidden from no one. There are reasons sometimes people like me, the Lord has to do certain things to give people hope, to see how he operates, to see the miraculous. It's just that when you get this, you can't think that you're better than somebody because of this. You understand what I'm saying? So, remember what Jesus said. He said, don't follow me because I'm the son of God. He said, follow me because I'm meek and lowly of heart. Qualifying factor for the son of God. Meekness and carrying himself low. That's one thing that we do not understand about God. He is more humble than anyone, but has a right to be more prideful than everyone. Yet, he chooses humility. Why? Because he knows how dangerous pride is. If God operated in pride, he himself would be blind. Last scripture, Ephesians 6.10. A final word. Y'all like, thank you, Jesus. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor. We haven't even talked about that, the armor. Put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. He's strategizing against you. And if you don't think he's strategizing you, it's because you think your value is too low. He ain't strategizing you because you young, you old, what race, what gender, whether you got a title. You actually think titles. You think the title of pastor or business leader or politician means anything to both sides? They are impressed because I'm a pastor? What is that? Some low title that you got on planet Earth until you become a king? And we're supposed to be moved. Heaven is supposed to be impressed because I preached some half-baked message to y'all that the Holy Spirit had to work with to get a point across. But if Jesus preached the same thing, you'd be out for the next 200 years. Ah! Jesus preached the same message. His first point, you'd be standing up, throwing Bibles at him, flaving, all that, running, shouting, crying. God is not impressed, except for character. I couldn't preach this message if it wasn't some on me now. I go back and listen to what I preach, and I just shake my head. I'm like, that is not me. You can, the, the, the crazy stuff is me. You know, interrupting myself, don't know where I am you know, using Ebonics from time to time or all the time. Oh, that's me. <laughs> but the stuff that's coming through that, that's not me. I know the difference between me and somebody else speaking through me. You see the man, but you can't see the individual that's speaking through the man. And so because you can't see the real man, you give the fake man the credit. Put on all of God's armor so you'll be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers, authorities of the unseen, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. The four classes of spirits that manipulate those seven types of dead flies. So the only hope that you have is to practice the word, no matter how you feel, and no matter what, what it looks like, always remember this. Practice the word even when you don't feel like doing it. You practice it long enough and you'll never feel like not doing it. It's an acquired taste. 
The Bible said in order to transform the physical realm, including your mindset, you're going to have to renew this nugget up here. But if you won't read those scriptures, you don't give yourself any power to fight against the seven flies. I should have entitled the message that to call the seven flies. That's a cool message. Y'all like whatever. Y'all got me today? So I mean, a wonderful sermon. Chastise. Conviction. Won't mean nothing if you don't start practicing it. The moment you get in the parking lot. And you got to blow the horn because somebody's going to read it back into your car. You want to know when you got it? Is when somebody runs into your car by accident and you go, you jump out laughing. See, you heard that? Mm, mm, I can do that. I've done it before. I don't, I don't allow that stuff to move me. The person didn't hit my car by accident and I hit somebody by accident. If I hit somebody by accident, I would want them to jump out laughing. So if somebody hit me, doing the others, what would you do if you were the one that hit them? Yeah. I want them to be cool. Then you be cool. Yeah. Yeah. Not you. You get out of the car speaking in tongues and cussing. <laughs> help me, Jesus. You don't need to help you. Help yourself. <laughs> Watch this. There's a recording device on you 24 hours, seven days a week. Not to judge you, but to see how much they don't have to. There's a recording device on you watching you all day long. Not to penalize you, but to see when you're ready to move up. But we've been taught God sitting up there with a great big old hammer, hoping that you run a red light so the angel can slash your tire and your car flip over and hit the telephone pole. Everybody say hallelujah. hallelujah. So, you're going to have to guard this. The only way you can know you off is what Jesus said in Revelations. He said, I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. I don't want to bless my enemy. No matter what you want to do. It doesn't matter what you want on the other side. And the stuff on the other side is so expensive and it's so insanely glorious, you're going to pay a price for it down there. We're not going to just give it to you nilly-willy because you got saved. You got to be able to value this stuff up here because the smallest item in heaven is more valuable and costs more than the entire universe. So you're going to pay some prices with your emotions. Watch this. To simply learn how to be like your heavenly father. And when you come upstairs, when you come up there, the more you're like him, the more of his inheritance you will be allowed to have access to. And that's a scary thing when the universe is not their inheritance. That's their basement. That's poverty. They're like, the inheritance, you can't imagine that. See, I'm good if you give me a whole planet and I can be a king. You know what I'm saying? Drive what I want to drive and, and eat what I want to eat and... I'm good there, but you're telling me that what we see is nowhere close? No, the universe, that's trash, that's poverty. That's just something we tinker around with when we bored. The real stuff that is in light seven times brighter than the Newton Day sun. I want you to look at those lights up there in the ceiling for a second. That is the light that you're going to live in. It's brighter than that. That's the atmosphere of heaven where the light is seven times brighter than the noonday sun and it has no sun. It says Jesus is the light. How does that even work? That you are a person, but you also light up heaven that's larger than the universe. I can't stand this low level religion that they're preaching where you got to basically shut your mind off and be a dummy. And the best thing we can come up with, won't he do it? No, he ain't doing nothing. I don't have a problem with you joking with that, but that's where we stuck is this silly, mundane, no integrity, no discipline, yes. no love. We can't tell the difference between you and Dracula. Yes, amen, amen. <laughs> I started to say, at least he believed in the blood. <laughs> that just kind of ran through my mind. See, that's probably the devil. It's, I don't know if it was the devil or if it was me. Sunday, I had everyone close their eyes. I wanted to show them the power of how words produce images. I said, everybody close your eyes. 
start saying names so it could produce an image. And then I heard a voice say, say Rick James. Rick James? Just, just out of nowhere. Y'all, that realm, they will use anything. They use stupid stuff just to confuse you. What Rick James got to do with this equation? Nothing. See how you're talking about it? We just wanted to confuse you. <laughs> the Bible says guard this. Do you know what it means to guard something? That means you have to stay awake and you got to, any little thing, I want you to think about this. Somebody tells you, guard that front door. That's an indication something is coming. In order for you to guard it, how many know you out there in the middle of the night, as soon as you hear a noise? <laughs> Make yourself known. Oh, that's a cat. Ooh, you almost lost one of your lives today, son. Just <laughs> bird goes by. Is that a bat? You're guarding a car drives past. Let me see where this goes. Okay, they disappeared. That car come back. Uh-oh, this may not be a drill. Look like some bullets might be flying tonight. See the guard? The Bible says do that with your mind. Every little thing that runs through it, question it. Where did that come from? Is that me? Is that the devil? Am I being manipulated? Where, why am I being tempted by this right now? Why is it I can't forgive this person? Yes. Why is it everywhere I go, the first thing I do is talk about the negative? Mm. Where, where, where's that coming from? And that's a lot of work to have to fight you and the devil at the same time. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. But the Bible says you can do it only if you put on all of the armor. All right, that's enough. It looked like a big fingernail. I was like, it looked like the fingernail of a lizard. Who got a big hand like that? See, that's the type of stupid stuff that runs through my mind. I got to just, <laughs> what's so funny is when I do it, Kevin says, like, yeah, well, if you got a crazy mind, you got a crazy mind. You understand what I'm saying? How many know your thoughts go crazy in the course of a day? But the worst ones are, there are thoughts that devalue you and devalue other people. That, my friend, is Lucifer using the fly. He has resurrected the dead fly and uses it for a moment and then lets it die again. So everybody say, get rid of the dead flies. Get rid of the dead flies. And if you want to know how many dead flies you have, read the word. Mm, I'm not doing that. Ask God and then ask the person that's closest to you. They'll tell you how many flies you got. But you don't want to, because, because of your pride, you don't want to hear how many flies you got from them. But they know. And whatever you are, don't be the dead fly in them. Some people are to fly. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we'll leave that alone before we go into deeper dungeon stuff. The Lord loves everybody the same way he loves Jesus. No matter what you have done, no matter what you do, his love for you will be the same. And because of that, he's willing to tell you the truth and make you even feel bad for a moment so you can get yourself together so that you can get what he reserved for you on the other side. I know that I'm behind, but I'm trying to get myself together so I can get it all. Yes, yes, yes. For me, for me, good is not good enough. Y'all got me? Let's go ahead and stand. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's lift our hands and give God thanks for a moment in praise. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Mm. Woo. Thank you, Jesus. The Holy Spirit is a type of anesthesia. He takes the things that are really difficult. He knows how to keep its effectiveness, but water down the pain so that you can receive it. There are some things that in order for it to, cover, to be cut out of you, it's very painful. Body can even go into shock. You've seen it in movies where a guy gets shot and they're like, look, we gotta get that bullet out, but they're on the battlefield, so there's nothing to stop the pain. And, and they're they taking that bullet out and the guy's screaming and sometimes the guy will faint because the pain. But that's one of the roles of the Holy Spirit. There's a reason why it's called the comforter. Sometimes he has to comfort you so that the Lord can take out that bullet. He can remove that thing. It, because for some of us, it's too painful to look at the nasty side of us. It's just too painful. And it's still pride and it's still human reasoning. But, but, but you have formed and shaped your mentality too long in that area. And so it's too painful for you to see anything. So the whole, you can ask the Holy Spirit to help you. He'll work it out. It's still going to be painful, 
but he blunts the pain. Always know that anything that God deals with you about, you can handle it. You just don't think you can. You may not want to deal with it, but the Lord knows that we can all deal with it. It's the only thing that will get us free, keep us free, get us healed, keep us healed. It's the only thing that will allow us to rule and reign with Christ and to be that expensive ornament that he wants to use. I don't want to be a regular person. And regular people in heaven are loved just as much as the important ones. But y'all, how many know in this life, in the eyes of men, you may not ever be important. In the eyes of men, you may never have that type of job or that business or that position where people look at you that way because of lack of opportunity, whatever it may be, socioeconomic status, lack of education, don't know certain things. But this is the only thing where everyone has a clean slate, whether you're a billionaire or whether you're homeless, whether you're a pastor or you're a congregation member. It's a clean slate. Everybody can get the exact same reward. So it would behoove you because there are not supposed to be any regular people in heaven. It's an open chance for all of us to be on the level of Jesus Christ. Remember what he said? He said, if you can do this, he said, I'll give you a place and you can sit next to me on my throne. Do you realize how crazy that is when the God of the universe says, you know what? We got a place for you on my throne. You can come sit here anytime you want to. That's, re that's the equality between you and God. Hey, so your value has to come up. Don't be worried about if nobody knows your name here. Heaven already knows your name. Everybody in heaven already knows your name. Some people down here, you don't want them to know your name. I wish some people didn't know mine. <laughs> but just remember, the Lord knows who you are, okay? But the God has promised that each one of us will be exalted in front of everyone. Everybody will know you. That's an amazing thing. To live around people where it's perfect love. Everybody knows who you are, even if they ne didn't meet you. And every person you come in contact with forever treats you as though you are Jesus. So... I think I can work on myself and deal with some hard stuff. And watch this, y'all. Just die and become a slave. Just die. Just let the feelings go and just die to it. I don't care how I feel. If it's the truth, it's the truth. So, Father, we thank you. We bless you and we honor you. We magnify you, O oh Lord God. We thank you for your tenderhearted mercies that you've had with us. We thank you for your patience that you've had with us. Thank you, O Lord God, for your goodness. Thank you, O Lord. I'm going to just be led when it comes to these salvation things. And if you're, if you're here and you're not saved, you know, the Bible just says that uh, if you will accept what Jesus did for you on the cross and say it in a form of a prayer, he'll save you. Salvation is very simple. It says God will forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And it says salvation is not something you can work for. It says it's a gift. You can't work for a gift. And so we're just going to worship God for a moment. And if that's you, you know you need to repent. Okay? You ain't got to know 30 scriptures in a song. All you got to do is tell God in your own words, Lord. And you have to say it. You don't have to shout it out loud. You got to at least whisper it. Because the Lord can see your heart, but you got to say it. It says believe in your heart and confess. And if it's you, just ask the Lord. Let's all just begin to worship for a moment. Just ask the Lord to come into your heart. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Let him know that you accept what Jesus did for you on the cross. And that his blood was the price for all sin. Tell him, I accept that and I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. It's as simple as that. And if you prayed that prayer, God is forgiving you now and cleansing you now. And he literally wrote your name in the book of heaven right now. Whether you're here or online or driving in the car listening. He just wrote your name in the book of life. Now you have an inheritance. Now you have a place. Men won't recognize you. Doesn't matter as long as God recognizes you. Father, we thank you. We bless you and we honor you. Thank you, O Lord God, for your forgiveness and your power. Thank you, Father. Thank you for just being patient with us. Thank you, Lord, for not casting us aside when we acted crazy. When we were angry at people for no reason, gossiped about people that you knew were only in that situation outside of their own control. Thank you for not being vindictive against us when we were vindictive towards others. Thank you for not looking down on us when we looked down on others because we didn't understand. Our pride blinded us. Help us to see clearly and to hear clearly because today it is more difficult to walk in love than any other day in the history of the planet. Help us to see past 
people in their sin and their wretchedness, their ghettoness, their unprofessionalism, their vindictiveness, their evilness. Help us to see past that and to love them, to give them a chance to change. Because you said in your word that the world would know us by our love, not by our preaching, not by our singing, not by our giving, not by our church services. You said that the world would recognize us as being different because we would have the ability to love outside of their ability. Help us to be that standard, O oh Lord God, in this world as we represent heaven, knowing that our eternity is secure and we can rest in that, we can have peace with that, and we can have joy with that, knowing that our eternity is, we will never die and live in a place where you said is fullness of joy and at God's right hand are pleasures forever. Thank you, O oh Lord God, for bringing us into your glorious kingdom. Praise you for it now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 How many are glad you came to church today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That is the way the Holy Spirit will minister hard things. There was oil on that where you were being operated on, but the blade was full of oil. You felt convicted, but you didn't feel crushed. That's, that's chastisement in love. Okay? So I'm getting ready to let you go. And, 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 and ma'am, if you don't want me to do that because you're uncomfortable, you know, just shake your head no. I just wanted, wanted y'all to see this cute little dog. So if you don't, you're okay with bringing the dog down, let him, let him see the little dog who was part of the service today. I, if he comes up missing, you know to come to my address, ma'am, because I didn't stole the dog. Come up here for a second. I'm going to let you come up because I don't want him to be nervous. Yeah, I'll help you out. His name is Charming. His name is Charming? Oh, wait a minute. He saved your life 10 years ago? Yeah, I will. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. This is not a drill. I need a microphone. Matter of fact, here, you can speak into this one right here. 10 years ago, I was ill. I was mentally ill. I was on 20 psychotropic drugs. I was in and out of mental hospitals for every three months. I tried to take my life at least 10 times. They got to the point where nothing was working and they were going to start uh, shock treatments, and shock treatments will mess with your brain, you forget things. And my doctor and my daughter said, why don't you try a service dog? I couldn't stand to be in a church or have people behind me or around me. The devil really was trying to take my life. And I got this dog when he was 12 years old, I mean 12 weeks old, I've had him now in December, 10 years. I couldn't leave my house for months on end because I couldn't be around people because I thought people were trying to kill me. This dog makes it so I can stand for people to touch me. I can stand to go to church. I can stand to be, have friends. And I know that he doesn't look like it, but he is God's biggest graceful present to me. <laughs> And his name is Charming. And thank you for help having him here. Hey, Amen. Man, that is a wonderful testimony. Amen. See, now that's, I don't even need to explain myself. Do you see how judging something wrong? Now watch this. Here I come into, no, I didn't do this. I come into the congregation. Who is this crazy, watch this. Who is this crazy person in here with a dog? See how that goes? You didn't label the person for what God used the animal to free them from. See, and this is what I mean by how God will go as far as he has to go. There is an answer for you in this planet you got to crowd to God and say, Lord, help me. I need the answer. Amen. This is what I mean by God is using more than just what's in these four walls. Amen. Here you got an app. How many of you know it was a donkey in scripture that rebuked the prophet because he couldn't see. And the donkey talked. And the man had a conversation with him. It was also a snake that was used by Lucifer. Remember, Lucifer was in the garden before the snake was. Jesus said, I saw him fall like lightning which means Satan was in the garden before Adam created. This planet is six, more than 6,000 years old. So when those animals were created, okay, before he corrupted the man, he corrupted the snake. Got two 
individuals to fall. So if God, if Satan will use an animal to bring men down, I think God might use an animal to bring somebody up. Man, I want that dog. I mean, you know, I'm not getting that dog. I might get one of his brothers or sisters. She is not giving up that dog. I'll take that dog. Y'all going to see me at the funeral home. That's one of, the, one of the most wonderful testimonies of God's love and mercy that I've heard in such a long time. Wow. That is amazing. All righty. Yo. Oh, just, no, just see me at the end. Yeah, just see me at the end. I will pray for her. Y'all know you're welcome. Hallelujah. As they said in the rap song, it's been a good day. <laughs> I don't know what the rest of the song says. So we'll leave it right there. Okay. So, so make sure y'all let first time visitors come down, introduce themselves for prayer, different things like that. And then um, go home, get some rest, be back in between. Hmm. Oh, yes. Thank you. They were supposed to bring the boxes. Oh, they're in the back. If you want one of the boxes, um, the boxes are over here in the back on your way out. You can grab one. It's right over here in this corner. You can grab a box. Just make sure you be diligent to fill it, follow the instructions, and, 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 and put the stuff in it. But, yeah, those boxes are back there. Thank you for reminding me about that. So make sure you let the first-time visitors know. Go home, take a nap, be prepared for tonight. We're going to have a really, really wonderful time. Invite some neighbors, invite some kids, you know, invite somebody because it's um, the things that they've done before have been really, really, just really, really wonderful. And it's important for kids to see this in the house of God. So it's going to be great. So God bless you all. You all have a great night. Be safe. And we'll see you back here this afternoon.